My name is Coleman Hughes. I'm a writer and host of the Conversations with Coleman podcast. In today's world, we can't escape discussions about race. It's an obsession that's taken center stage in our culture. But I can't help but wonder, why? Why is our society so fixated on this topic? In my new book, The End of Race Politics, I argue for a return to the ideals that inspired the American Civil Rights Movement. I reveal how our departure from the colorblind ideal has led to a new era marked by fear, paranoia, and resentment. By fixating on race, we lose sight of what it means to be truly anti-racist. I believe that a colorblind society is possible, and in the end of race politics, I provide the intellectual tools to make it happen. Join me on this journey to rethink the conversation. The end of race politics is available for pre-sale now. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Cindy Yu. Cindy Yu is an assistant editor at The Spectator magazine, and she's the host of the Chinese Whispers podcast, which is actually one of my favorite podcasts. We talk about whether China will invade Taiwan. We talk about whether the West should adopt a Cold War-like mentality towards China. We discuss the phenomenon of Chinese espionage in the West. We talk about the wave of immigration from Hong Kong into the UK. We talk about the nosedive in China's birth rate over the past 10 years. We talk about the so-called century of humiliation. We talk about the legacy of Xi Jinping. We talk about the apparent futility of the democracy movement in China and much more. So without further ado, Cindy Yu. Okay, Cindy Yu. Thanks so much for coming on my show. Thanks for having me. So first of all, I'm a huge fan of your podcast, Chinese Whispers. I catch almost every episode and I really recommend uh, recommend it to anyone in my audience that's interested in learning more about China. So congratulations on that. Well, that's really kind. It's good to know that someone listens. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, so you, uh, you write for The Spectator as well and uh, you focus on China. And so I'm curious, how did you, uh, how did you kind of come to this career? What, what's your mm. background and what was your path to this topic? Sure. Um, I was born in China uh, in the 90s. So really exciting time to be seeing China growing up. Uh, my family and I moved to the UK when I was around nine, 10 ish. Um, and I've just been in kind of London and in the UK and generally since then. And I kind of fell into journalism because uh, when I was at university, I was applying for different internships and The Spectator was the only one that didn't ask for a CV, a resume, as mm. Americans would say. And I thought, you know, that sounds fun. I'll try to do the tasks that they want me to do instead of sending a CV off. And I got in. Um, and I got in to do podcasts for The Spectator, uh, but it was through my conversations with my editor, uh, Fraser Nelson, about my upbringing, about my family, that we realized actually there was a big gap in understanding of China in the English speaking world. Mm -hmm. um, America is slightly better for this, but in the UK, certainly. Um, and so we thought, well, you know, why not combine that with the fact that I can make podcasts? And bam, that's how it happened. And I've, I've been writing a bit more as well, as you say. So yeah, it's, it's felt quite natural, although it wasn't planned at all. Um, and I've really enjoyed kind of going back to my roots, as it were, my childhood roots um, through my work uh, and also, you know, through my studies as well, because I did a master's in contemporary Chinese studies. So kind of combining all of that to be where I am now. So you say... Uh Americans have a slightly better understanding of China uh, than people in the UK. Why do you think that is? I think it's a, it's a great question. I think it's probably because migration from China and Asia in general, has uh, East Asia at least, has been more towards America. You mm -hmm. know, if you just look at geographical terms, if you look at the fact that I think in California during the gold rush in the 1880s, a quarter of Californians were Chinese immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, so that is an immigration history that the UK doesn't have. The Asians we have here in the UK are more likely to be South Asians, Indians and Pakistanis. So you don't have that diaspora there talking about things, you know, being present. The other thing I think is that, you know, America has a lot more at stake from China's rising mm. than the UK does. Um, and the UK kind of in the last century let go of its world leader status and passed it over to America. And so who comes next is 
you know, slightly less, um, what's the right word for this, less immediately concerning to the UK in a way that it is not for the US because it is that is immediately concerning. So I think there's more at stake for the Americans to understand China better. And then the final thing I would say is just, just it's a larger country. You know, they're more academics, they're more journalists who've been to China uh, compared to the UK where it's sometimes the, the discourse is still quite small and often domestic focused. Hmm. Um, now, that's not to say that all Americans understand China or most people who speak about China in America understand China. Right. But certainly the volume is more. When I look at good China reporting English language, more often than not, it's from American journalists. Yeah. Um, so actually, one of your recent podcast episodes was titled, uh, Does China Care What Britain Thinks? <laughs> Which I thought was a hilarious title. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? What why did that controversy or question arise and uh, what is your answer to it? Yeah, so that was an episode I did where I interviewed the British Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly. Um, and we talked about lots of things and that was just one of the things that came up, which is just, you know, Foreign Secretary, you lead the UK's foreign policy, but do you actually think that when it comes to China, China cares about the UK as opposed to the US? Mm -hmm. Because when we're talking about this, battle of superpowers, it is between China and the US and the UK is uh, slightly, you know, not not at, on the front line with that one. So I asked him that question um, and he said, you know, well, actually we can support the US in whatever ways we can and it is still important for us to engage with China, even if they don't necessarily see us as on, being on the front line. And I thought that was a fair enough answer. Um, that is true, you know, just because the UK is not the world leader anymore doesn't mean it shouldn't have a really pivotal role to play in this area. So I think that was a fair enough answer. But when it comes to China, you know, when you have the conversation, I went to China earlier this year to see some family and, you know, talking to family and friends there, they don't care really about the UK's position on China, you know, Brexit in particular rightly or wrongly, has been in the Chinese mindset, you know, a bad thing for the UK to do in terms of diminishing its own international influence. So they tend to care more about America or about the European Union, um, less about the UK. Um, and I think maybe, Colin, you have a slightly different perspective on this because you are US-based, mm -hmm. but in the UK, we can often talk about it as if we are the biggest people in the conversation still, when I say mm -hmm. that, I mean the UK. Mm -hmm. But actually, it does seem like a lot of the China-US conversations actually happen above the British level. Mm. Yeah, I think so too, probably, yeah. Um, let's speak about China's foreign policy a little bit. Uh, in, in a big picture sense, you know, China, we, you know, we're all looking at what's happening in Israel, we're all looking at what's happening in Ukraine and uh, coming at it f from a perspective of, you know, a mix of self-interest mm. um, and, you know, wanting to be perhaps on the right side objectively of, of a conflict, at, at least we speak about it that way in America. How do you think China sees these kinds of issues? What is its interest? What kind of interest is it pursuing, if any? Sure. I think that from my understanding of the Chinese leadership, and they are notoriously opaque, mm -hmm. um, so we can't talk about those politicians in the same way we talk about the Biden administration or the British politicians. But having caveated that, my understanding of their understanding of international relations is that it's a interest first yeah. approach. Because China has suffered so much in the last, well, let's say 200 years, they are putting their interests first above all else. Um, and I, I do think I get a feeling from them where morality isn't really at play when it comes to international relations. It's more about what um, satisfies your national interests or at least for the party, what stabilizes the country such that the party can still be preserved. And one example I can give for this is its reaction to the Ukraine war. You know, China has for so long talked about the principles of national sovereignty and growing up in China, that was really important, you know, kind of drummed into me as a child in, in the education system, the importance of national sovereignty because China's borders were so infiltrated and invaded by lots of different foreign forces during this so-called century of humiliation. So modern China, we are told, really cares about national borders. But then when Russia invaded Ukraine, <laughs> that position suddenly became totally superficial. You know, it wasn't backed up by any of the action or the rhetoric on China's side. Um, and the reason for that is because national interests trumped any moral high ground that Ukraine might have, that any any desire China might have to protest uh, at, at the invasion of another uh, country's national sovereignty. 
because China has a really long border with Russia, it's one, over 1,400 kilometers, it doesn't want to make Russia an enemy. There are also lots of different other things to do with energy security, to do with the fact that Russian's economy is importing lots from China right now. That means that China made a basically made a calculus to say it's better for us to stay out of this one and, you know, support Russia where we need to, but not get involved such that we are sending PLA troops to the front line or anything like that. But we're keeping both sides sweet and probably when push comes to shove, we're more on the Russian side. So, you know, that's a complete interest first approach to, to international relations, which by the way, is not necessarily controversial. Lots of people in America also advocate for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think basically China is just- It's actually the default worldwide. Yeah. It's really only a few countries <laughs> that even debate whether interest first or morality first. And I often think of some of the politicians who say that are only saying that as a kind of cloak, a moral cloak mm -hmm. for what their actual interests are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's a whole nother conversation. So I think that's how they see the world, that it's, the stronger wins because that kind of Darwinian conflict is what they've just come through and survived and come out on top on. Um, and so, you know, why should we go from morality first now? Mm -hmm. You mentioned this phrase century of humiliation, which I think won't be familiar to a lot mm -hmm. of people. Can you explain what that is and how important it is to uh, the, the way people think about foreign policy in China? Sure. So I think that is something that all people in China would be feeling quite keenly on. And I'm not saying that from a scientific perspective. Polling is notoriously hard in China, but just anecdotally and through the education system, the notion of a century humiliation has been drummed into people, young or old, rich or poor, because they can see it, they've lived through it, they, they had grandparents who lived through it. And what it refers to is basically from about 1840 onwards, which is the first opium war that the, uh, that the British fought against China. Basically, the ruling dynasty at the time in China, the Qing dynasty, refused to open up its borders for trade. And in a very kind of con uh, concise way, the British brought gunboats instead and said, we're going to fight you for control of these ports. And the thing that we want to import into your country is opium. Obviously, highly controversial and the Qing dynasty did not. Okay, But their military power was simply not up to scratch compared to the British. So that failure, that defeat in that 1840 war meant that Hong Kong was parceled out. And that's why there's this whole kind of current problem with Hong Kong at the moment. Um, and that was only the beginning of a series of what's called unequal treaties, where China basically parceled out more and more of its sovereignty, more and more of its ports and territories to not just the British, various different foreign uh, forces, including Russia and Japan, um, less so America at the time. And so that's what the Chinese refer to as a century of humiliation. For the Chinese Communist Party, it's a really important narrative because they want to say, we brought you out of the century of humiliation. Only when the Chinese Communist Party took control of China in 1949 did that century end. Mm -hmm. But I think in my perspective, if you look at what's happened since the Communist Party has controlled China, that humiliation, that suffering continued and continues. Um, China is obviously in a much different place now, but if you look at things like the Great Leap Forward, the famine that followed that, the Cultural Revolution, um, in the last few years, a zero COVID policy, <laughs> you know, I think the Chinese people are still suffering quite a lot, actually. But it comes from the inside now. Yeah, and, and, and then the CCP would not call that part of the century of humiliation. Right, right. I'm always excited to talk about a longtime sponsor of this show, Ground News. Navigating today's complex news landscape requires a tool that transcends single source biases. And that's where Ground News comes in. Ground News aggregates articles from across the globe and the political spectrum, allowing you to compare how different media outlets cover the same story. From left wing and right wing slant to the ownership of the sources, Ground News offers a comprehensive and balanced view, challenging your assumptions daily. Ground News tells you the total number of articles published on the story and gives you the political affiliation of each article. Plus, it allows you to compare headlines for every story. So, for example, today there's a story about how Netanyahu said that the IDF has killed half of Hamas battalion commanders. Now, the more left-leaning Times of Israel has the headline, Netanyahu claims half of Hamas battalion commanders killed, whereas the more right-leaning New York Post just says, Israel takes out half of Hamas battalion commanders. So you can see that the left-wing sources are framing Netanyahu's claim more skeptically, whereas the right-wing sources are more inclined to believe it. This is the kind of tool that makes you an informed consumer of the news. 
Personally, my favorite feature in Ground News is the blind spot feature, where you can see which stories are being ignored by the left and the right, respectively, which gives you an insight into what each side wants to ignore, in other words, the ideological bias of each side. Ground News is not just an app or a website. It's an essential tool for anyone seeking to engage critically with world events and form a well-rounded perspective. So try Ground News today and experience news in a way that challenges and enlightens you. Right now, Ground News is having its biggest sale of the year. You can get 40% off their Vantage subscription, which is what I used to do my news analysis, if you go to the link ground.news slash Coleman, or you subscribe to the pro plan for as little as $1 a month. I really appreciate what Ground News is doing, and I hope you check them out. So um, many people in the West talk about the Ukraine war, our, you know, America's failure in Afghanistan, our pullout, and all of our foreign policy in terms of the effect it may have on China's uh, willingness to invade Taiwan. Yeah. I've always suspected that, though there may be something to this, that probably China's calculus about whether or not to invade in Taiwan may not have everything to do with us. Like, it may <laughs> no. be a bit of a America-centric attitude to think that Xi Jinping is just like carefully watching what the U.S. do, what U.S. does, and that's the majority of his thinking. Um, but you, you'll, you'll know much more about this. I mean, what? First of all, do you think it's likely that China will invade Taiwan? And secondly, do you think that uh, America and, and Europe broadly? our attitude towards our own military interventionism is a big factor in that decision. Mm. So uh, on your first question, uh, depends on the time scale, I think. I don't think it's likely in the next year or the next five years, I wouldn't put money on an invasion. Mm -hmm. But after that, so much can change in international relations. Um, the US, UK and Australia have this nuclear submarine deal called AUKUS, which would change the power dynamic in the Asia Pacific. Uh, the US is also gathering other allies like uh, India and Japan, South Korea, to really kind of build up this deterrence effect against China. And uh, it might be that in five, 10 years, China decides, gosh, if we don't go now, we're never going to get this island back. Mm. Um, so I can't speak for that far ahead. Um, but, you know, in the next few years, one thing that is not US related at all about China's decision is just the fact that an invasion like that would not be like an invasion of Ukraine because it's not on land. Mm -hmm. You know, invading Taiwan would require a joint operation, possibly an amphibious landing, um, which means that air, sea, and uh, air, sea, and land would all be utilized. Mm -hmm. And the PLA is not strong enough for that mm -hmm. at the moment. And that's what all the you know the 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 in industry analysts say at the moment. So they literally can't take it quickly at the moment. And if they give Americans, uh, you know, a chance to fight back, America has numerous military bases in the region, not, in, uh, not, America has numerous bases in the region, including in Japan, in Okinawa. I think they wouldn't be sure of a quick invasion. They look at Ukraine and Russia and they think, God, we don't want a long drawn out war. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the fundamental first reason why an invasion wouldn't happen in the short term. The second reason I think is because, you know, when it comes to this Russia parallel, Putin is one man in Russia who has controlled Russia for decades now. There is no party system behind him per se. Whereas in China, until recently, there was a relatively expected 10-year changeover of leader. Obviously, that's not now abolished under Xi Jinping. But the party is still an organization with 100 million people. You know, just let that sinking 100 million people in this party that came before Xi Jinping that will probably exist after he goes as well. What I'm trying to say is that the institution is incredibly strong. Mm. Xi, in his public statements, is not about all about him. It's actually all about the party. Mm. That's the main important thing. So I think that if he were to take a brash decision one morning and just say, screw it, I'm just going to go for Taiwan, the party institution will be much stronger in fighting back and mm. saying that's not a sensible decision than Russia would have. Right. Now, I do think there are parallels in a sense that the PLA has learned a lot from the US, uh, from the Russian army. Uh, it's got literally sharing some uh, military technologies. And so it will be observing Russians, uh, Russia's experience on the ground in Ukraine to say, okay, what can we learn here? Why has the invasion taken so long? Blah, 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 blah. So I think that will be a lesson learnt. The other lesson is just the force of, um, of the American-led Western counter-sanctions. I think that will 
sober some minds in in China as well mm. because they're not Russia it's true then they have an economy that's 11 times larger or something like that but you know I think before the invasion before February 2022 China might have said you know the West is in decline it's separated it's disunited I think what the Ukraine war has shown is that actually when push comes to shove the West doesn't have to be disunited mm. so I think that will also sober minds now the ultimate question is how do all of these balance of factors mix up mm -hmm. in any one given point and you basically can't predict um i think either way but i think in the short term it's, it's unlikely um and your second question was just the force of you know american military yeah you sort of answered it actually yeah 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 you actually did answer both um so speaking of xi jinping you know if say he were to pass away today for whatever reason and his obituaries were being written mm. coming out tomorrow what do you think his legacy would be? Well, it depends on if you are asking the People's Daily or, <laughs> or the Washington Post, yeah, you know. Maybe, give, me, give me both. <laughs> um, I think that the Chinese state media view would be, here is a man who came from really tough background. You know, his father was purged during the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. His family was torn apart. He himself went down to the countryside uh, as a party kind of uh, punishment um, for seven years. And he came back and he worked his way up the top uh, of the party rankings through loyalty, dedication to the party, dedication to the people. And you can see that in some achievements such as the 2012 anti-corruption campaign, uh, which has, you know, been a relatively root and stem uh, root, root out of corruption in China in, in the party system. They would look at perhaps uh, the fact that they probably say that they, they won the war against COVID. They would say that. And they probably hmm. say that um, the vaccine rollout was a success as well when it comes to the whole world because China showed, you know, this kind of leadership. Um, they probably say that, you know, under Xi Jinping, China stood up again hmm. if he died today. Now, the Washington Post version, the Western media version would be quite different, I think. You know, COVID was not a success. In fact, we're still seeing the economic ramifications of that now. It's true that the Chinese economy was slowing already before zero COVID, but right now it's just not rebounding in the way that it should be. Um, and the slowdown has been worse than people feared. Uh, they would probably point to the fact that the anti-corruption campaign was probably just a way to purge his enemies and actually... Um, the data that comes out to show the lack of corruption isn't necessarily reliable. And if you look at the fact that he's still purging people now, you know, uh, General Li Shangfu this year, Foreign Minister Qing Gang, a few, few of the rocket forces generals, you know, corruption is still there and he's still clearly not got control of the situation at home. Um, you've got young people trying to lie flat, you know, this phrase that they say, which basically kind of getting off the hamster wheel of life, mm -hmm. just trying to kind of give up and go for more like a Diogenes inspired stoic lifestyle. Um, and the economy is not in a good place and people don't have hope necessarily for the future. That's what, you know, they would probably say his legacy is because he turned away from the market reforms that made China such a success after the Cultural Revolution. Um, but, you know, I think, I think the truth would probably be somewhere lying in the middle of those, those two. Um, less hagiographic than, <laughs> than the People's Daily version, probably. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think he's got a very mixed legacy. And now I think if you ask the average Chinese person, that would be really interesting. Mm. And I, I couldn't answer that mm. very reliably mm -hmm. because of this Napoleon polling data uh, factor. But the fact is there are a lot of Chinese people who have a much more positive view of the government than we see from the, from the outside. Mm. And that's not because they're brainwashed. That's because they've got other things. And I think you had Ko Yijing on the podcast recently and yeah, yeah. she put forward some of those arguments quite um, interestingly. Mm. Yeah, my, my, my guess is he at minimum is perceived as a strong leader. Yeah. Right, which is like a lot of people, there was some interesting polling about people that voted for Trump in America and down, down the line, many of them saw all of his flaws, but the one thing they agreed on was that he was a strong leader. Right. And sometimes that, I think... Um, in, in the commentary, we can underestimate how important that is to the typical person. Especially with the background of the century of humiliation, mm -hmm. you know, to see China, quote unquote, standing up again. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a Chinese person, you're not going to be rooting for the other side. You're rooting for your side to be doing better. Right. So I saw a fact recently uh, that uh, apparently there were uh, something like 9.5 million births in China this year. 
which was down from like 17 mm. million just six years ago. In other words, live births have almost cut in half just in the past mm -hmm. six years, which is really just an astounding fact. Uh, I'm curious, do you, have you looked into what people feel the causes of this trend are and perhaps do you, can you speculate about what the consequences will be? Yeah, it's, it's, well, we're in a situation now where China is not the most populated country in the world because that's right. not India and China's population is shrinking. Um, I think the reason for that, you know, obviously people first thought is the one child policy which came in in 1980 and was uh, abolished in 2016, or at least the, the one-child policy became the two-child policy in 2016. And obviously that's going to have an impact because, you know, demogra demographers know that replacement rate for population is 2.1. You know, mm -hmm. two parents have to have at least over two children to re replace that population size. And the Chinese government knew that as well, but they yet they forced the majority of the country to only have one child mm. for, for for 36 years. So that's going to have an impact. But I think part of the impact of that and part of the reason why birth rates haven't bounced back since 2016 is because partly there's been a cultural shift. You know, so people my generation who are of childbearing age who've but who've grown up as only children don't think that they need siblings mm. you know society is so funny it's so manipulable sometimes like that you don't grow up with siblings you don't desire siblings mm -hmm. it's just the norm for you mm -hmm. you know don't nobody you knew grew up in a big family at all and you might have aunts and uncles but you know i grew up thinking that wasn't chinese i'd watch western tv shows and think oh my gosh they've have they've got siblings i just don't think that's very chinese <laughs> but of course that's ridiculous because yeah. just a generation before me they had always they had siblings but i think it's a it's a mentality shift so people don't desire that kind of stuff for young people today the other thing is you know the cost of living basically um i don't have the num numbers to hand but i think chinese cities are some of the most ex expensive cities to live in when you compare house prices to income mm. you know that ratio now china is good because parents tend to help culturally speaking um and yet when you look at um, houses and also the education expectations for middle class people to put onto their children, you know, this tiger mom stereotype becomes huge investment mm -hmm. in your child's education, and extracurriculars. All of that makes having one child a massive investment, let alone more. So I think that keeps a lot of people from doing it. And I, I would say hazard a final guess, which would just be uh, the fact that women are more educated than ever in China. You know, this is this generation of women are more educated than women have ever been in China. And f lots of them, you know, they're like, well, we don't want to marry into a patriarchal family in the, the, the patriarchal expectations of my in-laws. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to have a mother-in-law who's telling me I've got to cook for my husband. I've got mm -hmm. to clean and I've got to do all this other stuff. <laughs> I want to focus on my career because I've got a master's in something, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that will also have its impact. Um, and the government needs to tackle that kind of stuff instead of just raising the cap more and more. It's now a three child cap, mm -hmm. which is essentially, you know, doesn't make a difference because people are still not having two kids. Mm -hmm. They've got to ease up things like the cost of living. They've got to ease up things like the expectations on women to be homemakers and to be career women. Um, and they've probably got to give some incentives to people as well. Um, but we've, we're yet to see anything kind of widespread on that. And you asked about the consequences of it. I think most immediately we're looking at an aging population in China. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I don't have the, the numbers to hand, but we're looking at very, we're looking at the most rapidly aging population in, in world history. Mm. China sets records in all kinds of ways. And what that means would be more uh, healthcare demands, uh, more social welfare demands as people are coming out of working age uh, and into uh, retirement, but they, they're not earning their own money. They need the state to help. Um, and so that will also have a cyclical effect on people having kids because if you're the working class working age people in between you've got your parents to look after who are retired you're not going to want to add more dependence mm -hmm. your kids mm -hmm. to that when you're an only child yourself right so you've got this inverse pyramid um and i think that will slow the economy the chinese economy and less productivity can go up in china uh and then in the future i think we're looking at china that's going to be much much smaller than it is at the moment which you know if the economy can handle it, if the society can handle it, I don't think fewer people on the planet is necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm.
I mean, but it, I, I can't imagine, like I've never seen a scenario, if you think of cities instead of countries, where a shrinking population was a good thing. Yeah. Almost, almost always it's a bad thing um, in the long run. And is there a scenario where China changes its attitude towards immigration as a result of this? And Very unlikely. Very unlikely. Very unlikely. It's a country <coughs> where 96% are Han Chinese. 96%. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the ethnic mix is not diverse at all. <laughs> And we know about the problems that the minorities have in China, if you just look at the Uyghurs. And if you look at Japan, a very similar culture, mm. a similar ethnic mix, you know, they've had this demographic problem for much longer than China has, and they've still not opened up to immigrants. So I don't mm. think China will either. Mm. Um, and you look at on the ground, for example, in the, on the southern, southern coast, where some of the universities have had partnerships with African universities, where there are some African students going there. But the amount of racism that they face, the amount of pushback they face from the local community is really remarkable, actually. Mm -hmm. So I don't think China, would, the government would want to kind of open that um, because as a society, it's just very kind of <laughs> it's not the kind of cultural melting pot that we might that the US and the UK or other kind of liberal democracies not all but some are right so one of the things about China I'm, I'm astounded by is whenever I meet someone that is in the know whether they are in the intelligence community or former intelligence or something and I ask them about the the problem of espionage mm -hmm. of Chinese spies in the West Basically, everyone says the same thing. They're like, yeah, there's tons. Like, it's like they're everywhere. Yeah. But there isn't necessarily an alarmism about it where, for example, if you dial the clock back to the Cold War and it were just like accepted that there are tons of Soviet spies everywhere, people would be freaking out about mm. it, right? Like, in a way, like overly freaking out. And that's what McCarthyism was and so forth. So basically, every expert agrees there are tons of spies from China in the West, but there's not a moral panic about it that I can detect, mm. at least broadly speaking, which is kind of interesting. I'm curious what your thoughts on that are. And also, uh, can you describe for people, if they're not familiar, what the espionage problem, to the extent it's a real problem at all, what it really looks like? And I, and I, if you can loop in, I, I know you said on your podcast there was a recent example of a of a at least someone accused of being a spy yeah. in Britain who you personally knew to some yeah. level. So can you talk about that? Sure. Um, so let me start with him. He's been what we know is that he's been arrested mm -hmm. earlier this year in March. Um, he's not been charged, and. Uh, it's a very confusing case and all I know about it, I know from media reporting um, and some outlets have gone as far as to naming him, but I, I did, yeah. I did know him um, in a professional basis because the Westminster China world is very small. He was a parliamentary researcher who worked for, um, in this kind of world. Um, and I just thought he was a totally normal guy. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, he's not been charged. So we. We just simply don't know what he's being accused of, uh, what, how guilty he is. We can't, uh, you know, conjecture on any of that. But it did create this massive, it whipped up this storm in Westminster in the UK um, where, you know, there were people saying, oh my gosh, anyone who spent time in China who speaks fluent Chinese is a problem case. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, <laughs> I vehemently disagree with that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a ridiculous position to take. Um, as a Chinese ethnic person, I kind of got used to people being a bit kind of iffy about, you know, how reliable people are. And I can understand that I'll never get a job in the foreign office because, you know, I've spent 10 years in China and God knows who I know. But, you know, if we can't even trust British born people or Western born people who just simply have insight into China through spending time there and have learned the language because we fear that they've been compromised, then that would be ridiculous. And I'm encouraged to hear you say that you don't think there's a moral panic because I feel like I do see a lot of moral panic. Mm. And I wonder if it were just at the start of it, basically, mm. it's going to get much worse from here. Mm. Um, and I think the US is really bad for this, actually. You know, if you look at, um, is it called the, Ch the China Initiative? that the State Department had a few years ago is now wound down, where it basically picked out Chinese ethnic scientists in leading American institutions um, and 
on very little evidence for some of them, accuse them of being compromised and supplying secrets to China. Some of them have been acquitted and the program has now been wound down. You know, that was, I think, um, a moral panic. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope you're right, Coleman. <laughs> you know, I think that now that you say that, I think um, there's a nuance, which is I think the security state is very panicked. Mm. And I highly doubt that any Chinese national or some anyone with too many ties to Chinese nationals could get a job in the federal government or pass any kind of security clearance. Yeah. So to that extent, I think that's totally true. Outside the security state, among the general population, mm. is there a kind of like, is there anything akin to what the Red Scare was during communism? I don't I don't know that there is. I don't think so. I yeah. think COVID was bad for this yeah. in general, but just because xenophobia comes out during times of fear and mm -hmm. tension and every single Chinese diaspora person I know um, has had some kind of funny experience mm -hmm. during COVID with, right. with people kind of, you know, Thinking you could only get sick from some of the Chinese. Absolutely, especially at the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. But outside of that, I agree. You know, I, yeah. I think the general population don't, you know, think anything less of Chinese people. Um, and I hope that stays the same. But, you know, if you look at uh, the reaction to Russians since the invasion of Ukraine, in sports, in music, in literature, it has been quite discouraging to see, actually. I agree, actually. I mean, I was, I was disheartened to see, um, I'm a very pro- pro free speech person. Uh, and I, I really try to maintain that even in the toughest times, I believe you should able, you should be able to be pro Hamas, you should be able mm. to be pro pro Putin, and express those views, which I think are atrocious and completely wrong. But you should be able to say them, mm. right, you shouldn't, you shouldn't necessarily have your career destroyed, right. Um, for, for example, I'm a, I'm a chess fan. And there was a chess player that got disqualified from the, the uh, I think it was Sergei Karyakin, from the global playoffs of chess, mm -hmm. right? Like the most important championship in chess, the playoffs for the championship he got disqualified from, by the way, which is why Ding Loren uh, replaced him and mm -hmm. ended up out of <laughs> 16 people winning the world championship. Right. So had, had Russia not invaded Ukraine, Ding Loren would not be, um, <laughs> chess champion of the world okay, which is a crazy <laughs> yeah it's like a crazy um butterfly effect yeah. kind of thing but yeah i mean the the way the way russian russian nationals with any dubious tenuous connection to putin alleged connection to the regime were turned on i thought was quite ugly and mm. unnecessary um to the cause of defending ukraine yeah, I 100% yeah. agree. And, and, you know. And if if China were to invade Taiwan, I would probably, be very probably the same thing would yeah. happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think I'm in a really privileged position um, when it comes to, you know, my, my influence and, and where I work. But I would be very scared for your average Chinese diaspora business person trying mm -hmm. to make a living for themselves. Right, because if you're three degrees of separation away from someone in the CCP, oh yeah, how's that going to look? I mean, 100 million people in the party, right? Like right. it's... <laughs> right, right. Um, and China is a country, and, and this is another one of my bugbears, Coleman, which is people who say, oh, you know, you've got links to the PLA or links to the CCP. Right. It's a this one is, si it's a one party system. Yeah, yeah, Everyone's yeah. got links to someone in the system because the system is everything. Right. right. <laughs> that doesn't mean you believe in it. Well, this is lazy journalism and and there were many people um uh, I mean I I I I know one guy who you know it was said that he had links to Putin during mm. the Trump Russia investigation because he he just had done business in Russia. Right. But he was like genuinely like I I met a guy once at a thing and now I'm yeah. in the New York Times talked about as as if I have links as if I have anything to do with the Trump Russia probe, right? Yeah. And this this kind of thing does happen. And once you're marked that way, it's pretty much impossible to get that association out of people's heads, even if there's nothing to it. Absolutely, yeah. especially if you don't have power in the discourse. Isn't isn't if you if you're not a journalist, if right. you don't have a way to put your side through, right? And we've seen that in the UK a couple of times where people with alleged links to the CCP, you know, you could be a businessman in uh, south of England doing a food takeaway business. And this is a real case. He was reported by uh, by the Times of London as a United Front agent, mm -hmm. allegedly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you put allegedly in front of an accusation like that. It doesn't just 
you know, discount the accusation. People still think that yeah. you're going to be a spy. Right. And so what is that businessman meant to do about that? There's nothing he can no, do yeah. about it. Yeah, there's nowhere to go. Um, and so that's concerning because that's, that's <coughs> being judged guilty without a trial. Right. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life is tough and it can be very helpful to work through your problems with a therapist. I've certainly benefited from therapy in the past. But it can be tough to travel back and forth to a therapist given all of our busy life schedules. That's why you should try BetterHelp. BetterHelp is entirely online, incredibly convenient, and built around your schedule. Fill out a quick questionnaire and you'll be paired with a licensed therapist. And here's a perk. If you ever feel the need, you can switch therapists at no extra charge. So you're always in control. Visit betterhelp.com slash Coleman today to get 10% off your first month. Remember that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Coleman. Um, speaking of which, do you think, um, obviously China is, China and America are the, the two nations vying for global superpower. Uh, do you think it makes sense from an American perspective? Do you think it would make sense to view China with really a kind of Cold War 2.0 mentality? Or do you think it makes sense to view China more as a, a friendly rival? Mm. Probably neither. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a Cold War because... In, during the Cold War, when we talk about containment of the USSR, that made sense. You could try to contain communism because communist states did very little business with non-communist states. China's not like that. Mm -hmm. China, as you know, Coleman, is, is the major trading partner, I think, of, of over 120 countries in the world. Um, not all of them are one-party systems. Some of them are democracies. Some of them are Western democracies. Mm -hmm. um, you can't contain China. You can't contain China's economic influence. Um, you, it, the, the diaspora for China, for example, is also, you know, so much more spread out in the world um, than during the Cold War for Russians. So that, the, you know, the people-to-people -people links, the business-to-business -business links um, are so much more than during, this, during the Cold War, where it did seem like there was, you know, an iron war between things. So if you can't contain China, then the mentality of containment doesn't make sense, I think, because... You know, when you look at China's influence, let's say in African countries, you can't just have a panic about it every time you're like, oh my God, China's built another railway because mm -hmm. that's what China does now. <coughs> okay, so what are you going to do about it instead? I think you have to compete with that. And mm -hmm. so when Biden talked about the so-called uh, Build Back Better World a few years ago, which seems to have fallen by the wayside a bit, you know, just being like, okay, you know, if you're, if you're a developing country, let's say in Africa or in Southeast Asia, you want Chinese money, how about we ease up lending for you too? You know, you can get some money from us too. And instead of making you democratize at a pace that you're not happy with or liberalizing markets at a pace you're not happy with, which the Chinese don't make you do, mm will just say, okay, you know, build your economy up first. But the West doesn't do that. Mm. It's hand-wringing about China at the moment. Um, so I think the Cold War mentality doesn't work. It doesn't apply to the reality on the ground. But I also do think that China is not a friendly rival necessarily. And this goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is just so hard to understand what the Chinese leadership is thinking. They deliberately make it so. They deliberately are very opaque. Um, they don't leak in the same way that uh, democracies do. So when we talk about what Xi Jinping is thinking, China analysts are often just reading the tea leaves. Mm. No, in previous decades, people knew more, but now the system is so good at keeping it a black box so that people have to second guess them that you know China analysts really don't know why Ting Gang was fired or why Li Shangfu was ousted and that kind of stuff. Um, which means that if China changes its motivation or if China's motivations have always been malicious, we don't know as much as we did before. Um, and so I wouldn't want to go out and say, you know, China is always going to be friendly. I think Blinken called it a competitive coexistence. Mm. And I think that's probably the best way to think about it, that it is going to be really competitive. <coughs> and it might not always be fair play, mm -hmm. but I think the US is okay with not doing fair play. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you're going to have to coexist mm -hmm. because China is not going anywhere. And you probably can't get rid of the Chinese Communist Party anytime soon. Mm. Speaking of which, um, I... I remember a few years ago, I was talking to um, a, a Chinese woman, born in China, but, but but in America, and her father, who still lives in China, is part of the kind of small 
pro-democracy activism mm. community. And she said something to me very, very somberly and very sincerely that always stuck with me. And which was, she said, I fear my father's wasted his life. And I never forgot that. Gosh, yeah. Uh, because for her, it just seemed so clearly futile. Mm. Uh, you know, it's not, it wasn't like, it's not like the civil rights movement. Like there's hope uh, or, or on the horizon that, that yeah. things will change um, for people who want that uh, system, who want democracy. Um, what, what do you think the prospects are for, for democracy in China? Is this just a pointless cause to be fighting or? Hmm. You know, Colin, this is a, <laughs> this is a question that I <coughs> battle with all the time um, because I have, you know, I, I obviously believe that democratic liberal principles are good, that people should have freedom of speech, that people shouldn't be punished for thinking things. Um, and yet the Chinese Communist Party seems like such a Goliath. How do you ever get rid of it? I, I don't know. And also... Part of me always fears if you do get rid of it, will it be an Arab Spring kind of situation where right. the country doesn't end up in a better position than right. before? Um, and I think it's easy for Western Democrats and liberals to say, you know, be great if China just had democracies. But I worry about the transition. Mm -hmm. And I think during the transition, anything could happen. Some more extreme person, more authoritarian person could come in and sweep through. Um, so I worry about... You know, I, I look at Taiwan and I think, oh God, wouldn't it be nice if China was just uh, a stable democracy like Taiwan? You know, you've obviously got a bit of corruption, you've got a bit of, you know, sniping in the media, all this sort of stuff. But it's largely, you know, it's a safe democracy. Wouldn't it be nice if China could just get there? But how do you get there? I worry about that um, without making this current situation worse. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm, I'm probably quite a risk averse person there when your friend's father probably... It's more of an ideologue, not ideologue, more of an idealist. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter how we get there. This is my final goal. Right. I want to get there. But I'm I'm worried about the transition. And I don't see enough examples of democratic transition going well mm. for me to think full steam ahead. Let's just do it without knowing how we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when it comes to a reality on the ground, the party has become more strong in the last um, maybe 10 years. Xi Jinping is obviously a much more centralized leader than before. Uh, when the internet came to China, people thought, oh, maybe this is a way to have dissidency. And in some ways it has opened up those kind of opportunities, but it has also given the government a way of surveying people and a way of um, controlling people, disseminating its propaganda that it didn't have before. And if you look at China's technological advancements in surveillance technology and that was something i was so struck by when i went to china this year is just how many cameras there were actively watching me at all times mm -hmm. now i don't think they were all government cameras mm -hmm. but private companies have taken facial recognition and run with it as a mm -hmm. technology so it's such that if you're um going home in a kind of residential count compound of the chinese sort you now in my compound at least you use facial recognition to get in you don't use a key fob Mm. So my, you know, the, the the property developer who owns my uh, my family's uh, compound, they know what everyone looks like. And if the government asks them for that data, are they really going to say no? So that's, you know, that surveillance is much more than it was before, even just before COVID. And so I do think the state is much stronger than before. I can see why your friend's dad is hopeful, though, because you can't just throw your hands up and say nothing's ever going to change because... If you always think that, then nothing will ever change. Mm -hmm. And I think no one really ever saw the USSR falling. So <laughs> we just don't know, basically. And I'm glad there are people like that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fighting for it. He might have wasted his life personally, but I'm glad that some people like that exist. Right. Okay, so you recently wrote a piece about uh, Chinese diplomats. Um, how are Chinese diplomats, how do they operate differently than our picture of, say, American and British diplomats. Yeah, so <laughs> this was a really fun piece of research because every single person I talked to who had worked with Chinese diplomats were like, oh my God, I've got so many stories to tell you. <laughs> How long do you have? Yeah. <laughs> so it's clearly quite a universal experience. Um, now, I think 
in the UK and in the US, we think of diplomats as building bridges. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're kind of like the lubricant between different countries mm -hmm. to make sure that they get along. Um, and if you need to fudge certain things, you can fudge certain things. Mm -hmm. But what I learned from researching that piece is actually Chinese diplomats are more like a moat. Mm -hmm. They're the bit in between the foreigners and the central leadership. Mm -hmm. They're not building bridges. They're mm -hmm. trying to keep you away from the center lead central right. leadership. Um, and that comes across in the way that they behave. They're not out there looking to have, you know, socials, to have beers on a Friday night. They're not trying to make friends with you. In fact, they always uh, uh, go to meetings in pairs so that each can spy on, not spy, but each can watch on the other one mm. and report back anything beyond the line. Mm. Um, and uh, Zhou Enlai, the China's former premier um, under Mao Zedong, he calls it China's civilian army. And that's how they always saw the foreign service in China. Mm. It's an army-like discipline. It's like the civilian version of the People's Liberation Army. It's not out there to build bridges. It's out there to get China's message across uh, and to be on message discipline and to serve China's ultimate goals, which doesn't necessarily include listening to what other people have to say. Right. Yeah. Okay, so... But call me if I can yeah, add, that does ahead. sometimes make them highly efficient. Mm. You know, if you if you just keep beating that discipline drum, mm -hmm. if you don't leak, you know, it is a it's a efficient, effective, sometimes effective way of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you get, you know, pluses and ne negatives, I think. Right. Yeah. Okay. Slight pivot. Um, you, you also wrote recently about the wave of immigrants from Hong Kong mm. to the UK, uh, I think 150,000. Can you explain why that happened and uh, maybe speculate about what you think the the sort of uh, effects of that will be? Sure, yeah. I think it happened because of what's been happening in Hong Kong in the last few years, um, which culminated in 2020 with China's national security law, which effectively ended this status of Hong Kong of one country, two systems that Hong Kong had been promised in 1997 when it returned to the people's uh, to, to China. Um, now people in Hong Kong, you know, because of the national security law, don't have the same freedom of speech that they had before that, um, which means that a lot of them are thinking about alternative things for their children in particular. The Hong Kongers I spoke to who are coming to the UK are worried about the next generation. They're young families who think, gosh, my child is going through primary school now. I don't want them to be inculcated in the same kind of communist propaganda that mm -hmm. seems to be coming into Hong Kong schools as a result of the recent politics. Um, so yeah, so 150,000 of them have applied for residency in the UK. And the UK has opened that up as a deliberate thing to do because I think Brit Britain always had this relationship with Hong Kong. We talked about the century of humiliation. Um, and so often some of them had links to the colonial rulers um, back in the 90s. And those people and their families can come over. Um, and it was a great thing for the UK to do in terms of importing highly skilled immigrants mm -hmm. um in terms of their impact on on the uk i think it would be so interesting to see someone i spoke to who works in this area said that we could see a, a hong kong born cabinet minister or even prime minister within our lifetimes and i think that's probably not unfair to say actually and the suspicion of chinese spies that will not apply to hong it doesn't Kongers. seem to apply yeah. to hong kongers right. so in the aftermath of the Westminster spy scandal, I talked to two people who are hoping to get onto the Conservative Party candidates list. Um, one of them is Hong Kong Chinese, the other one's mainland Chinese, and they have very different things to say. Mm. The mainland Chinese was seen with suspicion mm -hmm. and didn't think that they could ever really get onto the list of candidates. Mm -hmm. The Hong Kong Chinese thought, yeah, it's all fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in fact, actually, if you look at um, the data out there, it has seemed like there's been such an influx of Hong Kongers to this country that they could be you know, they could swing the next election mm. depending on which regions they, they've gone to. Uh, some of the constituencies that they live in are quite marginal. And so that whoever wins the Hong Kong vote could really be, you know, very... Pivotal. Are they swing voters? Um, it seems like uh, from opinion polling that actually three quarters of them are conservative voters. Oh, interesting. Family values, mm -hmm. you know, low taxes in Hong Kong, so mm -hmm. don't believe in the huge size of the state, mm. um, believing education, kind of pull yourself up by a bootstrap kind of philosophy. But of course, I heard an episode that you did recently about left and right, and what does that actually mean yeah, anyway? Yeah, yeah. And I, right. lo I love that so much. Right. But, you know, f f it seems like the Hong Kongers here associate more with the conservative values. Yeah. Okay, so uh, before I let you go, 
I guess uh, I already plugged all your stuff at the beginning. Usually I have guests plug it at the end, but I already plugged you. Chinese Whispers, fantastic podcast. I really recommend everyone subscribe to that. Um, and uh, anything else you you want to plug? You have a Twitter. You have you're at the Spectator. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm on Twitter. I don't use it that often. I don't. I kind of kind of low key hate it. Yeah. <laughs> How come? Um, I just. Yeah, I do. I just don't think it, uh, it's clicked for me. I just don't really mm. understand what it's for. All I do mm. is whenever I have something new out, I post it on there. But that's more like a newsletter. I don't right. engage in, in. But do you? I, I don't. I don't see you doing that too often. I don't. Either. I don't much either. I mean, I only have the past two weeks or so because sometimes you get updates on the war mm. more quickly from Twitter than you do from mm. legacy media. Aside from that, I. I scan Twitter, but I don't really post much because yeah. I don't get that much out of it. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, yeah. I'd be happy to just lurk on Twitter. Years ago, I definitely posted much more. Yeah, but yeah. I think now, it can. There is such a thing as Twitter brain, isn't there? Where people yeah. carry out their personal relationships on that. Anyway, totally. that's a whole other topic. No, I think it's insane. I was like, <laughs> 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 just text a friend if you need to. If you need to get it out, just email about a your dinner the night yeah. before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of would-be tweets that I've just sent as emails to people, and I'm very glad that I did. Let's put it that I'd way. I'd love to see your drafts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for having me, All right, Coleman. Cindy. Thanks so much. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always, thanks for watching. And feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.